discuss planetary boundaries, and then we're going to have this panel discussion, which I'm very much looking forward to because we have some great panelists. So uh, to take the broadest uh, possible overview, we are, those, we, those of us who are alive in this day and time, are living in a, a moment of the most uh, profound transformation in the history of human civilization. We have quadrupled the numbers of human beings in less than a century. And I'm not going to get into a discussion of population dynamics, except to say briefly that, believe it or not, it is a success story unfolding in slow motion. Uh, population dynamics are stabilizing in the main, but there are continuing areas of rapid population growth, especially a dozen countries or so in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And by mid-century Africa, we'll have more people than China or India. And by the end of this century, Africa will have more people than China and India combined. So we have a, a continuing challenge to educate girls and empower women and reduce a child mortality and make fertility management uh, ubiquitously available. And when those four uh, policies are implemented successfully simultaneously, then the population dynamics are likely to stabilize in those areas of continued high growth. But the rapid expansion of human population uh, sets the stage as only one of three factors that have fundamentally altered the relationship between humanity and the ecological systems of the earth upon which our flourishing and even our survival depend. The second factor is the development of technologies far more powerful than any our grandparents or great-grandparents could have possibly imagined. And some of these technologies have led to miraculous improvements uh, in the quality of life, but some have uh, a, an aggregate power that is now enabling us to press against the limits of what the ecological system can absorb, can sustain itself in the force of these uh, new technologies, uh, especially energy, because for 150 years now, when oil was first drilled in Pennsylvania and joined up with coal and then later gas, fossil fuels uh, still to this day account for 80% of all the energy that we use in the global economy and in our lives on this planet. So population growth plus technological power plus the third element, the most important, our way of thinking. And more specifically, to cite a few examples, our continued unhealthy obsession with short-term measurements of whether we are making progress or not, doing the right thing or not, uh, and our unwillingness all too often to take a longer term view. And ecological systems really require us to shift our way of thinking. But in any case, when you take those three factors and combine them, what has resulted is a collision between us and the ecological system of the Earth. And some parts of that system are now buckling from the impact. And we see this collision manifested in the destruction of forests around the world at a very rapid rate. Last year was the second worst year for forest loss in history. Generally speaking, we lose about one football field per second. Uh, the destruction of wetlands and mangrove forests the loss of the web of life that 
we depend on and of which we are a part, the development of freshwater scarcity, the depletion of topsoils and underground water aquifers, uh, the threats, the growing threats to ocean uh, productivity. But the most vulnerable part of the Earth's ecological system by far is the climate system. And there's a very simple reason why that sometimes uh, is obscured from our view. When we walk out of this building and look up at the sky, it seems like a vast and limitless expanse. But as most are aware, in reality, it's an incredibly thin shell surrounding the planet with a total volume of molecules that is only a tiny fraction of what exists in our imagination of the sky. And the power of 7.6 billion people with these powerful technologies that use fossil fuels for 80% of our energy means that we are spewing 110 million tons of man-made heat-trapping global warming pollution into that thin shell of atmosphere every day. We are treating it as an open sewer for the gaseous waste of our global civilization. We are trapped inside that sp spherical uh, atmosphere that surrounds us, that little shell. And the accumulated amount of man-made global warming pollution that we have dumped there now traps as much extra heat energy compared to the entire existence of humanity prior to now, as much extra heat energy as would be released by 500,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every day. It's a big planet. But that is an enormous amount of energy. And there are certain aspects of the climate system, ocean currents, wind currents, indeed most parts of the Earth's ecological system that are finely tuned to the conditions present when human civilization first built our first cities 10,000 years ago. This extra heat energy goes predominantly into the oceans. And the Earth system as a whole tends to even out the heat distribution. All such open systems do. And in the case of our planet, the primary engine driving the climate system is the redistribution of heat from the tropics on either side of the equator to the poles because, of course, the sun hits a direct, at a more direct angle in the tropics year-round and only a glancing blow six months of each year at the poles, respectively. So how is this heat redistributed? Through the ocean currents and through the wind currents and complex phenomena like El Nino and others that are less known in popular culture. The temperature differential between the North Pole, which is more significant because of the land mass that is in bulk in the Northern uh, Hemisphere and uh, crucial in the Southern Hemisphere, but Antarctica is isolated by the Southern Ocean. But the temperature differential between the temperature at the North Pole and the temperature at the equator is a kind of formula, x over y. And it helps define the pattern of all of these ocean and wind currents. And we're changing it. Because even when the sun hits a glancing blow at the North Pole, it encounters ice and snow, and the ice and snow melts, and the Arctic Ocean is melting. And when it melts, the sun's rays don't bounce off anymore. They're absorbed by the dark ocean and the dark land. And so the temperature increases two to four times 
more rapidly in the Arctic as it does in the tropics. So all of these patterns are struggling to maintain the equilibrium that has existed for the entirety of our civilization's history, and they're now changing. The Northern Hemisphere jet stream, which has served, among other purposes, the movement of storms and weather systems across the North American continent and Eurasia, is now becoming a bit chaotic with large loops and episodic periods of disorganization. Why does that matter? Well, two weeks ago, Hurricane Florence hit uh, North and South Carolina. And instead of moving off, it just stayed there. The same thing happened one year ago with Hurricane Harvey in Houston, Texas, which dropped as much water as 500 days of the full flow of Niagara Falls, five feet of water. And Hurricane Florence three weeks ago was the fifth once in a thousand year rainfall event in the previous 12 months in the United States. And I'm not even mentioning Super Typhoon Manghut, which was even stronger and even bigger and devastated parts of Luzon and the Philippines and then Hong Kong. And the range of consequences that we're seeing are apocalyptic. And the scientists predicted them. And the scientists were exactly right. And because they were right, we should pay more careful attention to what they're predicting now will occur if we continue to put another 110 million tons every single day up there. Do we want to lose 50% of the living species on this earth on our watch? Do we want to see a long list of great cities like Cape Town struggling with the possibility of running out of water completely? Do we want more giant fires like the ones in California last month and across many parts of the world, Mongolia? I want above the, in Johan's home country, six big fires up north of the Arctic Circle in Sweden. The consequences should capture our attention. And we should conclude that we really have to change. And business has a role. Investors has a role, have a role. Governments have a role. Now, the good news is we have relief available to us, heaven sent, with solar energy and wind energy and batteries and electric vehicles and sustainable agriculture and sustainable forestry. For the 40 years I've worked on this, the essential problem has been, and is now, that the maximum which seems politically feasible still falls well short of the minimum necessary to satisfy the laws of physics. So what do we do in a situation like that? The answer is very simple. We expand the limits of what is politically feasible. And there too, businesses and investors and regional and local governments, along with nation states, can play a role. In conclusion, we can solve this. And the remaining question is, will we solve it? Last week, California, which if a nation would be the fifth largest national economy in the world, just passed and signed a new law. By 2045, 100% renewable energy will be required by law. 100% carbon neutral for the entire economy of the entire state of California. This is in the spirit of the Paris Agreement. And the Paris Agreement is not yet producing the results we need, but we are approaching the five-year mark when, according to the treaty, every nation must take stock and increase ambition. So I hope that this uh, meeting along with the others that have been organized here will help to add to that momentum. And as I often say, I will close with a reminder that for anyone who thinks we do not, as human beings, have the political will to bring about the necessary changes, please remember that political will is itself a renewable resource. Thank you. <laughs>
couldn't tell. But... Um, thank you so much for that. Now, you set the stage brilliantly because you actually teed up um, um, our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, Professor Johan Rockström, who actually, by the way, many of you know from um, his fantastic work on planetary boundaries, and you probably think um, the Stockholm um, Resilience Institute, but actually recently announced as the director of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Assessment, which is the world's leading um, school of um, study on these topics. So congratulations to you, Johan. And perhaps you can um, take us forward in this discussion of your thinking of how these things are connected and what you think uh, we should do next. Johan. Thank you so much, Dominic. And um, let me just start by making a minor correction to uh, President Gore's presentation. Scientists were actually not entirely right. If there's a red thread over the last 20 years, is that science has underestimated yeah, true. the pace it's of change. True. There is reason to be quite critical, actually. And uh, today, we're seeing that things are changing faster than science yeah, predicted true. it should. Based on the evidence presented by Al Gore, the scientific conclusion is, as you know, that we've entered a whole new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, where we as humanity are the driving force of change on Earth. The only reason, in fact, that the temperature on Earth has not exceeded one degree Celsius, which is the warmest temperature on Earth since the last ice age 12,000 years ago, is thanks to exactly what President Gore presented to us, the absorption capacity in the biosphere, the resilience of the planet, has been and actually continues to be extraordinarily high, but we're starting to see the buckles, the cracks in that capacity. Earth resilience is starting to go down. And the latest scientific evidence shows that we today have so much empirical observations of an Earth system that is regulated by the capacity of carbon sinks, of regulating energy fluxes in oceans, and that we have tipping elements in the Earth system illustrated here, which are mapped and published increasingly in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. We have the permafrost thawing risks. We have the albedo changes when the planet gets darker due to melting ice. We have the rising evidence that the three big rainforest systems in the Amazon, in the Congo, and in Indonesia have tipping points that could irreversibly push them into a savanna state. We have rising evidence that what keeps us in an equilibrium state that we've had since the last ice age depends on these tipping elements that we need to become stewards of. In fact, we know so much from the paleoclimatic science today that over the last 1.2 million years, we've been harmoniously cycling between glacial and interglacial periods roughly six to eight times. The so-called Milankovic cycles with 100,000 years of ice age, roughly four degrees Celsius lower temperature than pre-industrial, and then we exit these 100,000 cycles into the 15 to 30,000 year long interglacials, shown here between zero and two degrees Celsius average warming, very narrow bands. We've had six to eight such cycles, and the Holocene is the nice little cycle in the middle, the most stable, the most harmonious, the precondition for our human economy. 1950, we go into the Great Acceleration, and we're pushing ourselves to the edge point of the interglacials since the last 1.2 million year period. And the latest science shows that we may be at a risk at two degrees Celsius of crossing a tipping point that would irreversibly push ourselves into hothouse future that would take us not to two, three, but potentially four or five, six degrees Celsius due to self-reinforcing warming in the biosphere. We know today already from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, for example, that at two degrees Celsius, we would have already a bump up to probably 2.5 degrees Celsius just because of the loss of this resilience in the Earth system. This gives tremendous scientific support to the Paris Climate Agreement. It gives tremendous scientific support to stay below 2 and aim for 1.5. Now, what's the journey we have to take? Well, we have to start, just as Christiana Figueres would have eminently with her stubborn optimism shared with us here, bend the curve of emissions no later than 2020, and rush in a decarbonization pathway shown here in gray, equal to a global carbon law of cutting emissions by half every decade to essentially a fossil fuel free world economy by mid-century. But that's not enough. We need to transform the food system from the single largest emitter shown here in brown to become the single largest carbon sink. We have the solutions for this, but this is an agricultural revolution. But not that is enough. We today 
have actually caused, as Al Gore showed, so much climate forcing, loaded so much in the oceans, that we need to, whether we like it or not, invest in carbon capture and storage and different forms of biological capture and storage to be able to keep climate forcing under two degrees. But not even that is enough. We have to maintain the negative carbon sinks in ecosystems so that we have a minimum level of resilience in oceans, coral reef systems, all the ocean systems, and terrestrial ecosystems on land. If we do all this, we have a 66% chance of staying under two. <laughs> this is the scientific conclusion. It is nothing less than a systemic, global sustainability transition that requires the stewardship of all the planetary boundaries. It's not enough to just decarbonize the energy system. We need to take care of biodiversity, land, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, air, the whole paradigm shift into a whole new logic for the future. As Al Gore also referred to a few weeks back, we met in San Francisco at the Global Climate Action Summit. We presented there, Christiana Figueres and myself, the Exponential Climate Action Roadmap, which is laying this diagnostic on the table, but at the same time looking at where are we heading? What is the pace of change we're seeing in the world today? We mapped out based on the empirical trend lines we're seeing on investment in renewable energies, technology advancements across different sectors in society, showing, working together with, for example, the Drawdown Project, that we have evidence today that we can cut emissions by half over the next decade between 2018 and 2030 across essentially all sectors in society. Particularly in, uh, important is the food consumption and agricultural sector where we today, through all the forms of practices from conservation tillage to value chain investments to reduction in food waste, can actually reduce half emissions by 2030. Now this is based on the trend lines we're seeing and the most encouraging one is on this graph. Mm -hmm. If you look at the last 15 years, the pace of increase of solar and wind in the world is doubling every fourth year. Now, that pace shows very little indent if you look at an exponential curve starting from zero between 2000 and 2015. It goes from roughly 1% to 2.8%. But if you prolong that curve in the orange line here, we end up in a situation that by 2030, 50% of the electricity in the world would originate from solar and wind if we continue doubling every fourth year. That's the nature and power of exponentials. Now, any economist would say, well, but you hit ceilings along the way. Well, isn't that our task, to avoid hitting those ceilings? On the left hand here, you have the number of countries that actually have decoupled emissions from economic growth. Today, we have 49 countries in that level. These are not any countries. These are countries representing 38% of global CO2 emissions. The projection to 2020 is over 50 countries. We see real trends of potentially reaching a tipping point because 50 countries is 25 percent of the countries in the world. When do we reach a point where the benefits of decarbonization become so obvious that it is a point where the minority may be able to tip over the majority? So to conclude, I think there is a very strong scientific message here that we can only succeed with our endeavors on human prosperity, of social inclusion, of meeting the SDGs, if we have them confined within the planetary boundaries. We now need to become planetary stewards to be able to have any chance on these social and aspirational targets that we've been setting. And that requires that the fourth industrial revolution, that the innovation investments that we're making are today confined within science-based targets of the Earth system. And there's so much discussion and enthusiasm and engagement around this, not only from science, but within business and policy around the world. So I think there's a real reason to meet here and chart the pathway, not only to adopt a new mind shift in terms of the logic around prosperity on Earth, but also how do we ramp up action and amplify. Thank you very much. John. Professor Rockstrom, thank you so much. So um, this is, is an interesting segue, so I'm going to move from just such a powerful kind of set of openings here and the scale of the challenge, the systemic nature of what we face, the time constraint in which we face it, but a level of optimism, um, whether it's political or indeed in terms of some of these trend lines, that this can be done. 
um, and turn to this side um, of the uh, stage. And actually, um, so I'm going to come to you, Ambassador Luis Alphonse de Alba. Now, for some of us, we might think we have a difficult job. Um, but, um, Ambassador, you've just been appointed Special Envoy for the United Nations Secretary General's 2019 Climate Summit to corral the nations of the world um, into these levels of ambition that we've just heard about. So we are all with you um, on this journey. Um, and we're very, very excited to hear, um, because it was only very recently that you were appointed this very, very important role, to hear from you as to um, your, your vision, your hopes for the summit, and compared to what we just heard in terms of the um, challenge ahead, um, some of the approaches that you think we're going to need to um, meet and raise on this political ambition. Ambassador. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic, and thank you very much for the help that you offered to me, because it's, indeed it's, it's going to be a big challenge. Let me tell you that it is precisely as Vice President Gore was uh, highlighting that we rise the level of uh, political will, the level of ambition, and that's the main objective of the summit next year. That's the reason the Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called for a summit meeting with head of state. But I would start by highlighting some uh, particularities to the, to, uh, for that summit. And let me go back a little bit because I have participated in the Copenhagen uh, meeting, uh, the Cancun meeting. I was the, the lead negotiator and I was in Paris. And I see a few differences uh, that uh, need to be introduced in order to be successful and to achieve the goals of, of the Paris Agreement. And the, the first one has to do with the inclusion. I think the summit next year uh, should not call only on leaders uh, to, to come to New York and, and make uh, speeches or even just to tell us what they have done. Uh, we need the leaders to, to feel the pressure and to commit to additional measures to increase the level of ambition that was set up. Because even if we uh, attain the levels of the Paris Agreement, we will still be behind. The Secretary General has been very clear, climate change is advancing much faster than we are. But in order to do that, uh, I, as I mentioned, leaders need to be pressured, and they need to be pressured positively. And that's why the meeting, the summit, should be a very inclusive one. One on which uh, private sector, on which uh, uh, the scientific community, the uh, civil society in general, will show up that uh, dealing with climate change is not only an urgent uh, responsibility, as it was clearly highlighted here, but it also makes sense. It, met, it makes sense economically, it makes sense uh, politically, it, sense, it makes sense morally. And uh, by inviting a number of factors, by highlighting what the opportunities are for a transformational approach to the way we have been dealing with climate change, I think we can make the difference and we can reach uh, some goals for 2020. Uh, if you follow the discussion during the last years, uh, we were not only uh, following the scientific uh, assessment, which is, has been uh, relatively worse than expected, but uh, on the other hand, there is a, a number of in, uh, governments and authorities that have uh, changed their mind and that they have undertaken new initiatives. And let me highlight that this is not only national governments. We are talking about a number of local authorities that have taken uh, serious steps. Vice President was mentioning the, the case of California and other states, but it's not only in the U.S., worldwide. Uh, there are a number of businesses that have taken the lead, so there, are, there is some positive elements of the developments we, we have had until now. So the big question for the, the summit, if I can go back, is first of all to uh, recognize that there is an intergovernmental process of negotiation which has gone quite slowly compared to the gravity of the problem, that we need to step up uh, and, and we need a successful COP, not only uh, this year but particularly next year when, when we will be approaching the, the 2020 uh, target that we set up in Paris that we need to increase the level of ambition from that, that that would be important, and that we will be dealing with a, with a different setting in terms of stakeholders. But let me 
have a final word on how do we increase the pressure on governments. Uh, and I think it is quite important, and especially talking about uh, these issues in the developed countries, we tend to focus on mitigation. We tend to focus on reducing emissions, and we forget that the majority of countries are victims of climate change. So we need a greater emphasis <coughs> on resilience, on adaptation, to get those countries more engaged, more supporting, uh, uh, supportive, and to pressure even more those uh, major emitters. So that would be also one of the objectives of the uh, summit next year. Inclusion, better balance between mitigation and adaptation, and finally, and it will come to the next presentation, a, a flow of financial resources that would be <laughs> absolutely necessary. And that will come not only from international institutions, you can be uh, reassured, it will have to come from business. Uh, the hundred billion dollars that we envisage since Copenhagen are far from being rich at this point, and I would say are very low compared to what is needed. So, thank you. Ambassador, thank you so much. Um, and it's very interesting what, uh, what you're saying there um, in terms of your vision uh, for the summit. Um, about this time next year, I think, in yes. General Assembly Week, probably here in, here in New York, right? Mm -hmm. um, that um, there's, this, there's this tone here of, yes, raising ambition, but being, having a positive agenda um, for governments and in, engaging, as you say, business, investors, non-state actors um, to create the momentum, mm -hmm. I suppose, in terms of the narrative that you're, you're looking for. Um, but at the same time, um, being realistic that there's a resilience agenda as well as a mitigation agenda. Um, so that sounds like a package of um, pretty interesting and some might argue um, an evolution in thinking um, in some of these uh, processes that we've seen before. Um, and a very interesting message, I think, for the audience in terms of um, the inclusion element we're seeking from the uh, summit next year. Um, you mentioned the money. Um, so let's turn to the Global Environment Facility, the uh, CEO and chairperson of the Global Environmental Facility, Naiko Ishii. Um, now, um, you've just had a very, very successful replenishment round. Congratulations, over $4 billion in the GEF's coffers now. Um, but interestingly, perhaps for the, for the um, audience here, you didn't necessarily take a traditional approach um, in terms of um, mobilizing uh, uh, excitement about the next replenishment round for the GEF, and it builds on some of the points that Ambassador made a little bit about the inclusion and different ways of thinking to solve the problem. Michael. Thank you, Dominic, and a very good evening to everyone. Um, it's really amazing how the global environmental agenda has evolved for the last few years. I took office actually six years ago, and uh, around that time, often I felt lonely, powerless, as if we were fighting against Stonewall. Situation has changed dramatically um, for the last few years, and look at this now that another environmental agenda has made it to this uh, very prominent stage, the main stage of this uh, prominent event, so that uh, it is a sea change uh, from my point of view. And what is behind this sea change? What happened? What changed? I think there are three reasons uh, for behind this change. Number one, actually science. That the science message uh, was delivered by uh, Johan and actually emphasized by Vice President. We were in the collision course with nature and we really don't have time. That message is getting much better communicated beyond the scientist cycle, a cycle, and definitely it has started to capture that the imagination and the action of the scientists. Definitely, Johan, you got me. Second thing, <laughs> second factor uh, behind, um, um, behind this change is actually the narrative. That the, by now, we come to know that the, in order for us to stay within the uh, Holocene, we need a transformational change. The way uh, we um, uh, eat and, uh, the food and the cities and the energy system, but that kind of transformation sometimes causes the fear on us that, then, oh, it may be very costly, it may be very difficult, and that kind of, you know, drag us on going forward, but no more. That is not the case anymore. By now, it is widely recognized that this kind of transformation 
if managed well, presents a huge potential in terms of innovation. I'm pretty sure we are hearing from other presenters that it creates the opportunity, business opportunity, the job creation, and the maybe livable cities and the much healthier food. So that kind of you know, notion, the narrative, actually help us move forward. So that's the second factor behind this journey of the global environmental um, the agenda. But the last one, third one, seems to be most important, at least an uh, uh, institution like us. That is the power of multi-stakeholder coalition as a very powerful mechanism to govern global environmental commons. Um, because the transformation we need, that the global commons we need, is an, uh, um, it's not just a government-to-government -government system, it really goes beyond uh, the government, uh, state actors, and uh, beyond the state actors, it really needs that then everybody, beyond national government, is subnational, the cities, but also business, definitely, and the CSO, the scientists, it really requires that everybody to come on board to flip the uh, key economic system. So that then um, the old model that then, uh, we, we, we have seen is so quite mainly as uh, uh, relies on the government government. Mm -hmm. And then that then it also that relies on kind of international treaties and also that the institutions like us to channel money from north to south. And it turned out to be simply not enough. So that, that this new uh, era, the new movement of this flourishing multi-stakeholder coalition proven to be a very effective way to govern this global commons. And it is really a good way to catalyze the system change. Unfortunately, like or not, GEF, the institution I'm leading, belongs to the old model. Hmm. And it's very clear by now, you know, let's say that the GEF was created 27 years ago with the purpose of to govern or safeguard the global commons. And it turned out to be we have not been able to deliver that expectation. And that is why we have made a significant dramatic change to the way we deliver the resources. So that the GEF 7 we have just concluded in June is our testimony, that our determination, how we want to change even the international institutions like us and a very much kind of old traditional model can do something useful to govern the global commons. Uh, for this and uh, um, the uh, replenishment, the next four years, we put the system approach at the center of our, pro of our strategy, and we take on, we try to see where, in fact, way we can catalyze the system change on the food system and the energy system, um, in the city system, and how we can help move on to the circular economy. So this is our approach, and all of them needs a multi-stakeholder co stakeholder coalition to move on. The largest program in, this, in the next four years is actually the Food and Land Use Coalition. And uh, I see uh, many of the, the, the uh, allies that are uh, partners in this room. But this is coming based on the notion that unless we transform the food system, there is no way for us to govern the global commons. And that's why that, uh, this system takes that, uh, the, uh, this program takes the system uh, initiative based on the science-based land use planning and the take on that the uh, broader integrated landscape approach and make sure that uh, we actually that uh, to um, uh, to articulate to help the supply chain approach so that the each stage of the business supply chain actually can deliver what they are supposed to deliver. So that is a good part. Now we are entering into the implementation for the last three weeks, together with many of you. We are in Africa, we are in India, we are in Indonesia. So that's the time actually the reality also comes in. I see that quite interest from the, the, um, the, the parties, uh, the, the actors, but the most interest is expressed by local business, not necessarily national government, because local business, particularly the ones who are interested in moving on to the su sustainable practice, actually are a bit of the um, isolated, and they feel it really makes sense for them to move on to the sustainable practice. Or is this, this the last one? Is this payoff, or should we just go back? 
to that traditional way of doing business. So they see, those people see this as a new approach as an instrument to move forward, to instrument to change that the market structure. Now that's why that, I think that this program has a potential, but we can only deliver together with the national government and local government, the business CSOs and the science together. My conclusion based on this journey is we can only deliver this by working together. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this is quite interesting. Something is sort of going on. If we'd had this conversation maybe five or six years ago, we probably wouldn't have had that from the CEO of the Global Environment Facility. Multi-stakeholder, new business models, systems transformation, focusing on key areas like food, as articulated by our opening speakers. Kind of new, not new, but you know, not necessarily the sectors that people were focusing on um, several years ago, but certainly opening up opportunities, an ambassador um, echoing that and thinking that let's get a new kind of geometry into the summit, which kind of harnesses some of this um, innovation and provides a, a, a positive direction and confidence for, for governments. Nico, um, if only there were more kind of leaders of international organizations in the way that you just articulated that, it would be a very, very interesting kind of um, uh, time that we would um, live in. You mentioned very, very much about local business which is very interesting indeed. You would expect a panel like this to now have a multinational, um, to have the business voice. And for you, um, what we thought we'd do is actually would take that local business um, perspective because a lot of the theory of change is around kind of innovation, new business models, purpose-driven models, disruptors, things that are gonna actually do what you're hoping to happen when you put the seed money in. And I'm delighted to have with us, right down the end of the panel, uh, David Yong, who is the founder of Green Monday, coming out of Hong Kong and then Greater China, who is one of the winners of the 2018 Social Entrepreneur Awards, but in a for-profit um, business model. He's got a very, very interesting kind of transformational approach, which is changing the kind of landscape of what's going on in Hong Kong in relation to the food system that uh, Nico mentioned. Uh, David, welcome. And perhaps you can kind of um, tell us more about what you're up to and link it to some of these uh, larger transformational kind of uh, challenges that have been set out in front of you. Well, um, thank you for having me. And um, the next few minutes I want to share with you the huge transformation of consumer behavior, particularly when it comes to diet choice that happened in Hong Kong and now spreading all over Asia or even globally. Um, exactly six years ago, that was when we started Green Monday. Um, I learned about climate change and the correlation between the food industry, particularly the livestock industry, about 12 years ago from United Nations reports. And at that time, I thought to myself that, well, besides energy, besides transportation, that's one thing that we can all do that can mitigate climate change um, and reduce our footprints, and not just carbon, but as I study more about it, it is also about water consumption, land use, uh, efficiency, and of course, coupled with the exploding glo global population, it is about food security as well. So food is actually at the nexus of many crises, um, with climate change, of course, being a big part of that. So I thought everyone at any given time they don't have to turn vegan, they don't have to go completely plant-based, but simply by shifting the ratio of what we consume between meats and plant-based, reducing meats and more plant-based, that would be a huge step towards changing um, our contribution or our impact to the environment. Now, Hong Kong happens to be a very unique case. Um, Hong Kong, 7.3 million population, clearly not the largest city in the world, but it is substantial. But what is very unique about Hong Kong is because of the affluence of the city. Hong Kong is number one in the world in meat consumption per capita. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I mean, that is a figure that when I was digging up numbers from, from USDA, and I saw that in 2008, 2009, Hong Kong actually surpassed the United States, again, on a per capita basis, as number one meat consumption capital in the world. That was shocking. Now, in, from 2006, since uh, watching the documentary from Vice President Al Gore to 2012, every single meal I was using that as an opportunity to try to tell people that your choice of food, even if we're doing family style, let's say five dishes, if you simply choose three out of five to be plant-based, you are helping the environment. 
And in those six years from 2006 to 2012, I almost have never had one person who talked back to me and say, you know what, that's right, simply by cutting meat consumption, we can save the planet. I have not had one person who talked back. And that includes not just in Hong Kong, but also during my travel to Shanghai, Beijing, Singapore, many places within Asia or even in North America. So in 2012, we started this social venture called Green Monday. It's multi-dimensional, it's a very integrated, cross multi-stakeholder approach. First of all, we create the movement, which is to suggest everyone, simply by changing the ratio of what you consume, suggesting one day a week. Monday is a symbolic beginning, but of course you can always go green Wednesday, green Sunday. Any day, the more the better. Um, that's number one. We engage schools, corporations, um, definitely restaurants, and say increase your plant-based choices. This is something that you, are, you can fulfill your corporate ESG and tell the world that you are doing something good. That's number, number one. Number two, we work on the food innovation side. We cannot just tell people to take something off their plates. We have to give them something new or alternative, which now we call alternative protein. But six years ago, it was still a very novel concept. So we partner with companies, uh, many Silicon Valley startups, such as Beyond Meat, that we say, hey, you know what? Hong Kong happens to be the best place. If you want to shift behavior, come to Hong Kong. We can make a difference. So we start working with them, bringing their products to Asia, to Hong Kong in particular. And we also, through our own food inno inno innovation arm, create a plant-based pork, a uh, pork alternative, basically. Now, in China and globally, the most consumed meat is actually pork. It's not chicken, it's not beef. And pork not only just contribute to carbon footprint, but it is also one of the biggest source of pollution for water, and it consumes a huge amount of water as well. Uh, China, there are 1.3 billion people in China, but there are also 700 million pigs. The ratio of human beings to pigs is two to one. <laughs> now think of the energy, think of the resources, mm -hmm. and think of the pollution that just the hawk industry creates. So our food lab, um, based in North America, but produ production done in uh, Asia, create a plant-based pork product that we just launched earlier this year. And because these products taste, sizz cooks, and the whole experience is just like meat, but with from a nutrition profile, it's actually better. No cholesterol, much lower fat, much, much lower calorie. So it fit very much the lifestyle of you know, the millennials and also just people who are into wellness. So with our food innovation arm and also our dining retail outlet of Green Common, plus the movement, these are working seamlessly together to now, basically when we go to a corporation or to a school or a restaurant, we say, these are the new ingredients that you can bring into your culinary practice. And with all the global attention and more and more media talking about this, you can gain a whole new group of customers that you would never have before. And this become a domino effect from Standard Chartered Bank, HSBC, Google, to more recently, Sands, Macau, or MGM. Tens of thousands of employees with their company, they just say, we will implement Green Monday without 30,000 employees, 50,000 employees. And at the same time, they are not just serving salad or tofu, but they have all these new exciting ingredients and products that are creating buzz and trend within the company. So that is how we create um, the movement. Now, very quickly as to the results. Before we started six years ago, there were only less than 5% of Hong Kong that had any sort of plant-based diet habits, whether it's one day, two days, or seven days, less than 5%. Today, 22% of Hong Kong are practicing some form of Green Monday, meaning they are actively reducing meat consumption and adopting plant-based diet to improve their own health and also the health of the planet. And we see that as a model that can be highly scalable to various regions, not just in Asia, but also around the world. Brilliant. So before this trend was kind of coming out of um, California alone, um, the kind of um, taking on the pork um, issue, if you like, um, in Hong Kong and into China. This is pretty interesting. Now, David, you also have these um, um, quite incredible 
corporate partnerships. You, you, you touched on a few there with um, MGM casinos in Macau and HSBC and Google, but also some retailers as well. You are, um, you, you're making some quite inroads in, in, in that space too. Absolutely. So um, in order to scale fast, we must work with existing stakeholders. Um, we are not going to build open shops fast enough, open restaurants fast enough. So we are now working with some of the biggest supermarket chains, such as Park and Shop in Hong Kong, which is the equivalent of a Safeway or Kroger in the United States. And they are now putting our Green Common corner or shop in shop inside the supermarket. So everyone can, when they walk into the, to their supermarket, they can see that there's a Green Common section that represents plant-based food, but also wholesome and healthy products that... Uh, and by doing that, we're shifting consumer habits. And just to kind of close, what is interesting is this is not necessarily the same phenomenon you might get in Europe or, or um, the West Coast of the United States. It's not necessarily just more affluent middle class people. There was something very interesting about the quality of the food or the food safety, which is also attractive to people who might even have less money but different need. Um, this is particularly uh, very true to China, which is... Um, People are not thinking about diet change necessarily because of climate change, but they are actively thinking about picking safe products because food scandals happen in uh, China and in certain Asian countries on such a regular basis that a three-year-old or an 83-year-old would know that you know, they, they crave for places um, or destination that they know they can truly trust the food. So we are trying to build that system as well, which is... This is not just about plant-based, this is not just about health, but also about integrity and food safety. Fantastic. So um, in terms of things that are changing out there, um, Nico and, and Ambassador, these are the sorts of sort of transformations rippling through um, not only the West, but also um, key markets and key growth areas like, uh, like, like China. Now, um, our final um, um, speaker on the panel, this is very interesting indeed, because um, I, I hope, um, Leanne, as you've been hearing, um, this conversation, kind of, I know what you're like, these synapses will be going. Um, Leanne Kemp is the CEO of and founder of Everledger, which is um, one of our kind of uh, technology pioneer companies here at the World Economic Forum, but much more besides, a pioneer in the use of blockchain in all sorts of interesting areas. I don't want to steal your thunder, but I will say that if anybody followed the Kimberley process um, to try and deal with blood diamonds, it was um, Leanne's blockchain um, um, approach that helped to kind of um, track um, what was a good and what was a bad um, diamond. The potential of unlocking the new technologies and sciences that uh, you mentioned, um, Vice President, into this space could be enormous. Um, Leanne, what's your kind of reflections? We're sort of getting into this sort of transformative um, approach to meet the uh, ambitions that Ambassador needs for the summit. Your reflections? Well, as we talk about sprinting to 2020, I sort of wind my mind back to uh, 1989. You know, it was an incredible time for the year. Something happened. Um, this guy called Tim Berners-Lee created this thing called HTTP. It was a hypertext protocol. It enabled the sharing of information and a connection of two computers to talk to each other. And this incredible innovation came out of that time, and it's called the WWW, the World Wide Web, the internet. And as we know it today, there's not a person on the planet and a government and a company that doesn't rely upon it to trade or communicate across the world. And we've seen many innovations in the space of technology over time, but most of those innovations have been you know, kept and, and guarded within some proprietary control, whether it be Apple or Google, devices that are in your hand. And yet we're facing fourth industrial revolution technologies. We talk about the global commons and we understand what they are, whether it's the soil and the air and the water. But let's think about it. We have this expanding mind. You know, I have a very young niece who every time I walk into the house, she's showing me something that she's built. She built herself out of her own mind. She visioned it. And she has the tooling in front of her to be able to create something that might be a simple game. Or she can actually start to ping information between her friends and talk about what's important to them. Straws, they don't want to see plastic anymore. We talk about the global commons, but what if we had a digital global commons? What if we had a people's technology? And what if we could enable that to be the, the tooling of every one of our children, our parents, 
and enabled a thinking mechanism to create the innovations that we need to not only survive commercially, but within our planet. And when we think about the exploding population in countries like Africa, that are willed under survival to solve for problems for themselves, yet half of the technologies are only regarded for the 1% of the 1%, the tier one countries, the large corporates. So what I compel in terms of technology is let's think about the digital global commons. And if we think as human beings that we might be able to solve for these exponential problems that are in front of us, then let's combine exponential technologies together, whether it be AI and robotics, and combine all of that at a cognitive layer that can actually solve for these issues together, but do it at a people technology level. So that's where I'm thinking in terms of how we can take this to the next level. Fascinating. I, mean, I, I expect that when you were listening to what uh, uh, Johan was saying and also um, uh, Vice President Gore, um, the ability to um, apply some of that AI or um, ma machine intelligence, not only to models that are kind of backtracking, but to look forward. I mean, that kind of potential of joining some of these things up, I guess in the scientific community, this is probably quite an exciting and compelling time as the cost of engaging with these technologies um, gets... Uh, uh, lower and lower, um, and probably in a very different space than um, what we've experienced in some of the uh, processes of negotiation, shall we say, um, in perhaps a rather more analog um, uh, international system. Um, Leon, do you sort of see that this exponential growth will really take off, or what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to work hard to make it happen? I think we have to think about moving beyond resilience, and let's build anti-fragility, you know, the strength in our muscling and the strength in our technology to become smarter over time and to be able to apply that to real problems uh, in the world. And so we, we are absolutely at a point of exponential, exponential crisis, exponential technologies. Um, so let's combine them together and purposely put them into, into, the, one, into the one view. Fabulous. Um, I can't resist just turning back to you, sir, for the last word. Um, yeah. From what you've heard on this panel, do we, are we offering any kind of seeds of hope? Uh, definitely. And <clears throat> just to pick up on the last uh, point, um, Conflict Diamonds, for example, I'm on the board of Apple. And just earlier today, I met with the chairman of Mars, who said, uh, made a point that resonates with me in the context of Apple. He said the age of commodities is coming to an end, and what he meant by commodities is uh, fungible uh, goods that just are anonymous in where they come from, and you just go into the market and there it is. But now, um, companies are being asked by their customers and their employees to be careful about where they buy what. Uh, is it being produced by child labor? We don't want it. Are the proceeds being used uh, for terrorism or the drug trade? We don't want it. And technologies like blockchain make that much easier to do. But to extend that uh, line of thought briefly, these new digital tools, the internet and World Wide Web, yes, but now the internet of things and machine learning and artificial intelligence and genomic and microbiomic sequencing are giving many executive teams the ability to manage electrons and atoms and molecules and genes with the same precision that the IT companies have demonstrated in managing bits of information. Together they make up a sustainability revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution but the speed of the digital revolution. And this new sustainability revolution is empowering the rising generation to believe that the new world they want is within their reach. They want to invest their money with managers who respect those values. They want to patronize businesses that respect those values. We have the emergence of Earth Incorporated, a global interconnected economy. We also have the emergence of a kind of global mind. If there is a fire in a shirt factory in Bangladesh, consumers in North America say, wait a minute, what about those working conditions? 
and the connectivity it, uh, means that change is demanded. That's being applied to greenhouse gases. It's being applied to unsustainable approaches to agriculture uh, and forestry, and those plastic straws and other plastics in the ocean. So I'm filled with hope and optimism, but my optimism is based on the kind of projections that Johan so brilliantly presented here. We have an exponential path to progress if it is matched to an exponential increase in political will. If you're an investor, one small point, Europe is now on the verge within weeks of passing a law requiring all asset managers in Europe to fully integrate ESG factors in the way they manage assets and report regularly on how they are performing those duties. This movement is also spreading. So the future of business, the future of investing, the future of human civilization really depends on getting out in front of this sustainability revolution and giving this rising generation the hopes in their hearts that we can get past this collision, that we can come back into harmony with the natural limits within which humanity can continue to flourish. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so there you have it. Um, you thought you were going to come to a kind of a climate uh, panel, but actually the threads here about kind of systems transformation, looking at these new forms of coalition, new forms of purpose-driven business model, and the ability to harness um, the opportunities of this new technological revolution. Ambassador, I hope we've given you some food for thought uh, for the summit, and we're all, I'm sure, across this panel and in the room here to help you um, as you move towards um, the next year. So, if I may, la just Please. one last word. To go beyond the rhetoric, we need ideas how to integrate actors into the summit. So I want to use the opportunity to invite you to brainstorm, allow. We don't want civil society business in parallel meetings. Uh, we want to integrate that into the summit and, and, and have a saying at the table. So, so it's a challenge that I want to leave in the room. Ambassador, that was more profound than you probably think. Um, maybe we can all help you on, on, on the panel to integrate properly for the first time into um, a global climate summit, um, this range of solutions, so we can all drive forward um, to meet the exponential um, um, outcomes that we deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, um, if you could join me in a round of applause for a wonderful panel. That will close the plenary and wish you all an excellent evening of, I'm sure, earnest conversation and no glasses of wine. <laughs> <laughs>